Hi. I think we're going to get started because we have an exciting program today. Can people on Zoom hear me? Yes? OK, great, because I'm speaking into his microphone. <laughs> um, so hi. I know most of you. I'm Julia Lupton, and I'm the co-director of the New Swan Shakespeare Center. And one of my great privileges every year is to curate our Kirk Davis Jr annual public Shakespeare lecture. And Kirk could not be here today in person, but I believe he is on Zoom. So if everybody could just give Kirk <laughs> a big round of applause. Uh, I think this is maybe our fifth lecture since Kirk endowed the series. And he's a great supporter of the center and the festival and of all things Shakespearean as well as lots of other activities on campus. So thank you, Kirk. I'm not sure even where the, <laughs> where the camera is. He said you're welcome. <laughs> oh, great. He said you're welcome. Nice. Great. Um, so the series is Public Shakespeare. And when I think about Public Shakespeare, Jeffrey Wilson is one of the figures who comes to mind. Jeff is the author now of three books on Shakespeare and public life. His book, Shakespeare and Game of Thrones, published by Rutledge in 2020. You may have heard of Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, it looks at the various ways in which the Wars of the Roses and Shakespeare's history plays shape the epic narrative of both the Martin novels and the hit series. The second book, second, right, Trump? Mm -hmm. The second book, which was published in the same year, <laughs> This guy has got to, <laughs> like, <laughs> just slow down. <laughs> uh, his book, Shakespeare and Trump, was published by Temple, also in 2020. And it applies literary criticism to real life, or at least what used to pass for real life <laughs> in this country, um, examining plot, character, villainy, soliloquy, <laughs> tragedy, myth, and metaphor to identify the formal features of the Trump phenomenon and its hidden causes, structure, and meaning. And then finally, his latest book, and I do have copies of this for sale if anyone is interested. It's available in paperback. Um, is called Richard III's Bodies from Medieval England to Modernity. And it looks at the historical and the Shakespearean Richard in the context of disability studies, among other frameworks. Now, although it's his third book, <laughs> it began as his dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I have graduate students, and aspiring graduate students here. Uh, so I want you to see that it indeed happens. Dissertations do become books, even if they're third in the queue <laughs> for publication. Had to get it right. <laughs> so anyway, it just felt right to welcome Jeff back to share his research, as well as his dissertation <laughs> and his humor <laughs> and his energy with us today. Um, Jeff writes public-facing books about Shakespeare, and he has also done a lot of research and teaching around public Shakespeare. He taught a course for nine years at Harvard University called Why Shakespeare? And in which he asked students to relate Shakespeare to their own lives and areas of study. And then, because he had a lot of time on his hand, he also published their term papers, adapted them, and put them on a website, and then got a lot of press for it. And, you know, the course is never over for Jeff, even if the grades have been submitted. And this kind of pedagogical innovation led to his recent appointment at Harvard as instructional design lead in the office of the Vice Provost of Advances in Learning. So that's really a great testament to Jeff's many skills. And I'm sure that Jeff would be happy to talk to folks after the lecture about how to create a dynamic career in the area of instructional design while remaining active as a scholar, if you have nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to walk over here now, guys. <laughs> And then we have a lot of people on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to join our other presenter today, who's the wonderful Thomas Varga. Thomas is also an alum. Uh, he received his MFA in acting from UCI in 2017. If you are a new Swan fan in the room, 
or on Zoom. You may have seen him as Caliban or Ariel Puck. or, I'm sorry, Puck. Caliban, Puck, it's same, same play. <laughs> <laughs> Caliban, Ariel. Caliban or Puck. And who else did you play for us over uh, the years? Autolycus in The Winter's Tale. Right, Autolycus in The Winter's one. Tale. Incredible performance. Uh, yeah, a couple others. Lots of others, yeah. okay. Um, and Thomas has also performed at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and in Counterbalance Theater Productions with the amazing Annie Louie as director. Uh, Thomas is a frequent visitor to my classes. I think, is Heather, Heather, Heather got to see him last week in our Romeo and Juliet session. Um, and in my classes, he explores text from an actor's point of view, which is always revelatory. He also helped create E9, which is our online Shakespeare class. And he coordinated all the voiceovers that were done by other MFA students uh, for that class, which now hundreds and hundreds of students have watched and listened to. So very happy. And so Thomas will be sharing some speeches from Shakespeare's Richard III tonight to accompany uh, Jeff's lecture. And so without much ado or <laughs> further ado or <laughs> any ado. About nothing. About nothing. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over <laughs> to Jeff and then also to Tom. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this sun of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Our stern alarms change to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now instead of mounting barbed steeds to threat the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why I, in this weak and piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, really excited to be here with you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Jose, Will, Debbie, for getting us all, all set up here. A year ago, I walked into my first year writing course, six inches off the ground, and proudly announced I just turned in the final manuscript for the book that I started my first year in graduate school in 2006. <laughs> One of my students raised his hand and said, I was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> it started with a small reading group that Julia had organized. She was on sabbatical that year, but said, a few of us can get together and we'll kind of once a week talk about Shakespeare. You all pick the plays. We met in a small conference room over by the Arts Bridge. When I came to UCI, I didn't really know much about Shakespeare. I came to think about Milton. Shout out to the great Victoria Silver. <laughs> I was fascinated by depictions of evil. So for our Shakespeare group, Robin Stewart said, Jeff, I'm sure you'll want to talk about Richard III. Uh, Robin was the smartest person I'd ever met, and I didn't want to look unintelligent, so I, even though I'd never heard of Richard III, I said, obviously, I'm going to want to talk about <laughs> Richard III. I learned that Richard III is part history, part myth. It tells the story of generations of civil war in medieval England reaching a crisis point. As Shakespeare depicts him, Richard is born with a severe physical disability. He's been stigmatized as lesser than for his entire life, 
and he becomes a ruthless warrior, but he's also a hilarious jokester. When his family comes into power, his brother Edward becomes king. He feels excluded from the joys of peacetime, meaning romantic love. He develops this complex narcissism that draws audiences into his topsy-turvy world of tragic suffering and comic irreverence. He glibly schemes and murders his way through his own family, killing anyone between him and the crown, until he runs into a collective of women whose sons and husbands he has killed. They forge the resistance against him, which culminates in the Battle of Bosworth, where Richard has a full mental breakdown, and the man who will go on to become King Henry VII defeats him in a war that Shakespeare presents as one of good versus evil. I also learned that Richard III was just one of Shakespeare's history plays that taken together tell the story of what's called the Tudor myth because it presents a politicized, mythologized origin story of the house of Tudor. The Tudor myth claimed that Henry IV's 1399 usurpation of Richard II, an anointed king ruling by divine right, prompted almost a century of disorder that culminated in the Wars of the Roses. Here's how it goes. Edward III's heir, Edward the Black Prince, died in 1376, one year before his father died in 1377. The line of royal succession passed to Edward III's grandson, Richard II. He was seen as a rotten king and deposed by his cousin, Henry IV, uh, of the House of Lancaster, which descends from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and whose emblem was the Red Rose. Henry IV's son, Henry V, became a national hero after winning land from France at the Battle of Agincourt. When Henry V died, age 36, his 11-month-old son, Henry VI, became king. He was a weak king, and Richard Plantagenet of the House of York launched the campaign to unseat him. The House of York, who wore the white roses, descended from the younger brother of Edward the Black Prince and John of Gaunt, but Richard Plantagenet laid claim to the throne via his uncle, a man named Edmund Mortimer, who descended from John of Gaunt's older brother, the Yorks forced Henry VI to name Edward IV his heir, cutting off the line of Lancaster. Now, according to Shakespeare, if you're Edward's younger brother, Richard, and you want to become king, there's only one thing to do. Kill everyone. <laughs> First, in Shakespeare's version, Richard and his brothers kill Prince Edward, Henry VI's son and heir. Then Richard kills Henry VI and marries Prince Edward's widow, Anne Neville, with Edward IV back on the throne, Richard next kills his older brother, George, Duke of Clarence. After Edward dies, Richard kills Edward's son, crowned King Edward V in 1483, as well as the next in line of royal succession, King Edward's younger brother, Richard. So these are the, the princes in the tower. Only with all of these royal claimants out of the way could Richard III become king, which he did in 1483. The centerpiece of the Tudor myth is the notion that Richard III, evil incarnate, was defeated in 1485 at the Battle of Bosworth by Henry Tudor, a young Welsh Earl who, <laughs> on his father's side, was the grandson of Owen Tudor, who had secretly married Catherine of Valois, the widow of Henry V, and on his mother's side was the great-great-grandson of John of Gaunt, and his mistress, whose illegitimate children, born out of wedlock, had been legitimized during the reign of Richard II, giving the young Henry Tudor a tenuous claim to be the last surviving Lancaster. <laughs> Henry Tudor then married the heiress of the House of York, united the two rival dynasties, inaugurating a period of peace and prosperity in England that included the reigns of Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth I, who was Queen of England when Shakespeare wrote his plays about this history. Historians have charted how this myth was invented by chroniclers commissioned by the Tudors, and disability scholars have shown how the myth stigmatized physical disability to demonize Richard III as the embodiment of evil. It's been 10 years, actually 10 years ago this coming Tuesday, they announced <laughs> that archeologists had discovered Richard III's skeleton under a parking lot in Leicester, England. The skeleton confirmed Richard's disability as historical fact, upending the certainties of earlier scholars who thought it had been fabricated by his political enemies. The Tudor historians of the 16th century didn't invent Richard's disability, but they did exaggerate it greatly. The exhumed skeleton shows signs of scoliosis, a sideways curvature of the spine, and perhaps uneven shoulders, but not kyphosis, which is the medical term for what Shakespeare called a bunchback. Shakespeare and his contemporaries also treated it as a congenital condition present at Richard's birth, when in all likelihood, 
Richard's scoliosis was adolescent onset. It didn't surface until his teenage years. But historians haven't yet rewritten Richard's biography to include this medieval king's experience with disability, an opportunity for what Alice Wyong calls disability visibility, but in history. Unlike five of his siblings, Richard survived infancy. War was all around, but he lived a comfortable childhood, bouncing from one castle to another, private education from tutors, military training on horseback. At eight years old, he lost his father to the war. A year later, his brother Edward became king, and Richard became Duke of Gloucester, age nine. Because of Richard's nobility, many records of his life exist, including the prayer book dating his uh, birth at Featheringham Castle to October 2nd, 1452. If Richard developed scoliosis during his teenage years, whom did he tell when his body started changing? His mother, his friends, a doctor? Was he experiencing pain? Many with scoliosis don't during uh, the early years. Did others at Middleham Castle in Yorkshire, where Richard spent his formative years, know about his condition? Did cruel kids tease him? If he experienced isolation, it certainly didn't stop Richard from fathering two children out of wedlock, probably during his late teenage years. Did scoliosis affect 19-year-old Richard's mobility during his first combat experience at the battles of Barnett and Tewkesbury in 1471? What conversations about his back did Richard have with his wife, Anne, whom he married in 1472? Richard would have had access to medical doctors that commoners didn't. Did they try a brace or stretch his spine with ropes? How did Richard manage the pain of these medical procedures? As he gathered lands and alliances, building a stronghold of power in Northern England during his 20s, did the adult Richard consider scoliosis to be a central feature of his identity, or was it no big deal? Would Anne massage his back? Was that a moment of intimacy that would have been missed if Richard hadn't been disabled? As Richard became Lord Protector over his nephew, Edward V, how often did he think about his back? Hardly ever, daily, once an hour, all the time? People with disabilities know that they're never far from your mind, even if you never talk about them. There's no record of anyone during Richard's life suggesting that disability was socially, that his disability was socially or politically disqual excuse me, disqualifying. He became the richest and most powerful landover, landowner in England and king in 1483. Did that disrupt assumptions about disability, about royalty? Did people read Richard in light of the king's two bodies? His scoliosis seems to have borne no significant relationship to his political crimes against his family or his legislative accomplishments on behalf of people living in poverty. Richard III is a disability icon precisely because his life is neither separable from nor reducible to disability. John Roos saw Richard firsthand. Two drawings in a document now known as the Roos Roll from 1484 depict no discernible disability. After the Battle of Bosworth, Roos needed to appease the newly crowned Henry VII. Roos's History of the Kings of England, 1486, said that Richard was, quote, retained within his mother's womb for two years, emerging with teeth and hair to the shoulders. He was small of stature, with a short face and unequal shoulders, the right higher and the left lower. In Roos's Latin manuscript, the passage was written with blanks. Someone later filled in the blanks to make the dexter, the right shoulder, higher, and the sinister, the left shoulder, lower. When Thomas More wrote his account of Richard's body, the raised shoulder jumped from the right side to the left side. The royal collections portrait shows an uneven shoulder line, right higher than left, but x-ray examination has revealed that the portrait originally did not depict a noticeable deformed uh, Richard. After its original composition around 1520, someone modified the portrait later in the 16th century to include sneering eyes, a tight frown, and a hunchback. You can see a, a little bit the jeweled chain that's on Richard's shoulders was pulled to the left in the revision to suggest a kind of massy shoulder. The first edition of Hollinshed's Chronicles, 1577, included only one short statement on, quote, this monster of nature and cruel tyrant, Richard III. It was the first text to refer to Richard as a monster, at least in print. There was one manuscript earlier. The word came from a flurry of Elizabethan broadsides reporting monstrous births. Monstrosity, from the Latin word monere, to warn, was the superstitious claim that babies born with physical deformities were signs of God's wrath. The second edition of Hollingshed's Chronicles added something else. It quoted more and then editorialized the full confluence of these qualities with the defects of favor and amiable proportion give proof to this rule of physiognomy 
And then in Latin, a deformity in appearance follows a deformity in character. Physiognomy, which translates to recognizing natures, is the pseudoscience claiming that internal essences can be read through external appearances. Shakespeare's Richard first appears in a couple brief scenes at the end of Henry VI, Part Two. It's, it's kind of like the post-credit scenes in the superhero flicks where you get the, the who's going to be the villain in the next one. Uh, and and he, he's the figure of Tudor lore when he first appears. One character calls Richard a heap of wrath, foul, indigested lump, as crooked in thy manners as thy shape. His enemies call him a crookback prodigy, employing a spiritual model of stigma in which the shape of material human bodies in the here and now signifies the orderly construction of reality by the divine. But halfway through Henry VI, part three, Shakespeare swerves to consider the emotional life of a man subjected to stigma. Richard starts talking to the audience in soliloquies and asides, giving voice to his inner torment, his anguish, his anger, his ambition, his irreverence, and his plans to deceive, betray, and kill his family. Then since the earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, to overbear such as are a better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown, and while as I live, to count the world but hell, and tell my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown. Shakespeare suggested, for the first time ever, that Richard's disability was not the sign of his villainy, but the cause a psychological model of stigma to rival the spiritual model. It's probably fair to say that this was the first modern representation of physical disability in English literature. This movement from spiritual model of stigma to psychological, from sign to cause, from metaphor to metonymy, can be seen as progress from medieval to modern ways of thinking. But Shakespeare questioned each model equally, the spiritual, by ascribing it to Richard's mortal enemies, whose hatred infects their interpretation, and the psychological by ascribing it to Richard himself, a habitual liar and murderer. For Shakespeare, following Thomas More, had Richard himself kill King Henry VI. Playing King Henry VI. If any spark of life be yet remaining, down, down to hell and say I sent thee thither. I that have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of. For I have often heard my mother say, I came into the world with my legs forward. Had I not reason, think ye, to make haste and seek their ruin that usurped our right? The midwife wondered. And the women cried, oh, Jesus, bless us, he is born with teeth. And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. And since the heavens have shaped my body, so let hell make crook to my mind to answer it. I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word, love, which graybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another, and not in me. I am myself alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keepst me from the light. But I will sort a pitchy day for thee, for I will buzz abroad such prophecies that Edward shall be fearful of his life, and then to purge his fear, I'll be thy death. King Henry and the prince, his son, are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next, and then the rest, counting myself but bad till I be best. I'll throw this body in another room, and triumph, Henry, in thy day of doom. Determined to prove a villain, he says at the start of Richard III. But should we hear determined in that line as I have been destined for villainy or 
as I have resolved myself to villainy. I am determined to prove a villain. In a quintessentially Shakespearean moment here, his dramatic mode, which is both tragic and ironic, calls upon some of life's biggest questions because it's tragic, but defers answers to the audience because it's ironic, leaving Richard's body to open to interpretation and different ages embracing different attitudes towards stigma. The changing meaning of disability repeatedly recontextualized through shifting perspectives and circumstances in Shakespeare's history plays has thus prompted and sustained more than 400 years of changing interpretations of Richard, his body, his behavior, and his status as either the villain or the victim of Tudor history. The meanings of Richard's disability change with time, not only in the course of Shakespeare's plays, but also in the broader cultural history surrounding them. Here's the thing. You won't believe me when I tell you, but I've scoured the 17th century and no one even noticed Shakespeare's causal reading of Richard's disability. No one said, hey, that's interesting that everyone before Shakespeare saw Richard's body as a sign of his evil behavior, but Shakespeare saw disability as not the sign, but the cause. Here's David Hume giving a figural interpretation in 16, or 1762. This prince was of a stature small, hump-backed, and had a harsh, disagreeable countenance, so that his body was in every particular no less deformed than his mind. But here's Samuel Johnson giving a causal interpretation only three years later in 1765. Richard speaks here the language of nature. Whoever is stigmatized with deformity has a constant source of envy in his mind and would counterbalance by some other superiority these, ad these advantages which he feels himself to want. The deformed, like other men, are displeased with inferiority and endeavor to gain ground by good or bad means as they are virtuous or corrupt. So I, I collected up all the representations of Richard's disability that I could find. And this chart shows that during the early modern era, before Samuel Johnson in 1765, more than two thirds of all discussions of Richard III, 15 out of 73, or sorry, 51 out of 73, advanced a figural interpretation. In the sources from the period that I've looked at, there were 53 figural interpretations of Richard's deformity compared to eight explicitly anti-figural interpretations, only two causal interpretations, both of those being Shakespeare's, and 11 sources that don't mention any disability at all. The chart for the modern age shows how swiftly and decisively that figural paradigm fell from behavior in the third quarter of the 18th century, the time of Johnson. So why did the interpretation change? I, I don't think it did, so, so let me explain. Colley Sibber adapted Richard III in 1699, cutting lines and characters who convey the spiritual model of stigma. David Garrick starred in Sibber's Richard III from 1741 to 76, acting with this new naturalistic style. William Hogarth painted Garrick as Richard III in 1745, showcasing a rising realism in the visual arts. Samuel Johnson's 1765 edition of Shakespeare's plays included several glosses explaining the psychological model of stigma to readers. The interpretation of Richard's body didn't change in the third quarter of the 18th century. Instead, the thing that people were interpreting changed. It wasn't a case of two people looking at the same thing and one person thinks X and another person thinks Y. Thanks to Sibber, Garrick, Hogarth, and Johnson, people before the 18th century and people after literally saw something different when they saw Richard III. The first woman to play Richard III was a Mrs. Laferve at a benefit on her behalf in London on March 4th, 1782. Little is known about her, but a surviving drawing shows no discernible deformity. In Philadelphia in 1836, Elizabeth Morton Woodson, known as Miss Henry Lewis, played Richard III, among other male parts, described by the theater manager as monstrosities such as have ever been objects of disgust to me, male characters performed by a female. <laughs> No review survive of Australian actress Eliza Winstanley's scandalous performance of Richard at Sydney's, uh, Sydney's Australian Olympic Theater in 1842, perhaps because critics boycotted it. One who refused to attend called women playing men a most preposterous notion. Such an attempt is unsexly and indelicate. <laughs> On September 17th, 1821, Richard III became the first play produced by an African-American theater company. The African Grove opened in 1816 in the backyard of 38 Thomas Street in New York City, created by William Henry Brown, a sailor from the West Indies who turned his talents crewing a ship to managing a black community space. 
Richard was played by Charles Taft, alias Charles Beard, a formerly enslaved, now free black man. According to New York Sheriff Mordecai Noah, who weirdly fancied himself a theater critic and whose racist reviews provide much of the surviving evidence of the beginning of the African Grove Theater, quote, a little dapper woolly headed waiter at the city hotel personated the Royal Plantagenet, end quote. Stigmatized because of his race and class, Taft played Richard as disabled in contrast to many productions at the time which were erasing Richard's disability, creating an opportunity to consider intersectionality between race and disability at the very inception of African-American theater. The actor, quote, had made the king humpbacked instead of crookbacked, having literally a hump behind his neck, little less than a camel's. Shaping the legs of an equal size was also difficult, but was overcome by placing false calves before and wearing a high-heeled shoe. For Taft's royal garments, King Richard had some robes made from discarded merino curtains of the ballrooms. Taft's first lines as Richard Americanized Richard III to thunderous applause from the African and Grove, now as the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the son of New York. <laughs> While disability was a part of the character's body, not the actor's, and blackness a part of the actor's, not the character's, for audiences, especially for any disabled black folk that were present, Taft's Richard was one step closer to authentic theatrical representation of the human condition. This Richard exhibited what Francis Beale calls double jeopardy, vulnerable to ableism and racism, although on different levels of dramatic illusion and theatrical reality. Richard the character in the imagined story and Taft the actor on the actual stage were outsiders within, to use Patricia Hill Collins' phrase, adding disability to, quote, the interlocking nature of race, gender, and class oppression. At times there will be analogies, but experiences of ableism are qualitatively different than experiences of racism, as Deborah K. King discusses, and moments of multiple jeopardy involve different systems of discrimination with different internal structures. Adapting a line from Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality in, 18, in 1989, Taft's Richard shows, quote, the need to account for multiple identity when considering how the theatrical world is constructed. Crenshaw wrote the social world is constructed, but we can think about the theatrical world and its construction. With a little imagination, Taft's embodiment of Richard may show to quote Robert McGrewer, what it means for the purposes of solidarity to come out as something you are, at least in some ways, not. To the extent that Taft, by performing Richard, was claiming Crip, to use Alison, Alison Kaffer's phrase, his Richard III suggests that such claims might be more available, more imaginable to some people than others. Taft's Richard shows what Sammy Shaw calls disidentification, which among, across, between minoritarian subjects can allow for coalitional theory and political solidarity. Taft's Richards invites us to adapt the ideas of Crenshaw and other critical race theorists into a notion of theatrical intersectionality. So this term addresses the interlocking systems of disadvantages and privileges that emerge when an identity on stage draws from both the imagined dramatic world of the character and the real theatrical world of the actor. An able-bodied actor may bring social privilege to their performance of a disabled character. Audiences may read an actor's racialized or gendered body in relation to a character's disabled body. When actor and character are differently disabled, or differently stigmatized rather, different formulations will occur. There may be an analogy suggested between two discrete traditions of stigma or two experiences of stigmatization. There may be multiple jeopardies suggested in which identities held by the actor are added into identities held by the character. The privileges and prejudices of the audience may mirror or may sharply de depart from those of the characters on stage. Above all, it will be impossible to conduct single issue analysis. Matrix analysis will be needed. When we line up late 18th and 19th century actors playing Richard in chronological order, we see the size of his hump decrease down to nothing over the first half of the century, and then grow back up over the second half of the century. The hump went away because performances of Richard III brought the body of the king into line with the conclusions of the historicism of the time. It was believed that Richard III, slandered by the Tudor dynasty, actually wasn't disabled. But that created problems, as Edwin Forrest learned. His Richard wasn't disabled, but his friend James Reese objected. We called Mr. Forrest's attention to the portrait of Richard as drawn by Shakespeare, and it was from this he should fashion his person. Indeed, the very language required it. 
the stigma levied at Richard's body in Shakespeare's text it makes no sense if Richard isn't disabled. So Reese had an idea. Let me advise you to present him in two pictures, one historical, the other Shakespeare. How so? You make him history from the first to the last. Why not make him Shakespeare up to the wooing of Lady Anne? He's here in all his deformity, for, he, for she says, blush, blush, thou lump of foul deformity. These words will not apply to your Richard, but to that of Shakespeare's. Still, the lady listens to his vows and is won by a tongue that can wheedle the devil. Well, what then? Why, after this, follow history. Carry out the words of Richard, change your dress, and appear a very proper man, as fashioned by a score of tailors. Sigmund Freud's libido theory posits a social economy of loving and being loved. Richard has instincts to love those who care for and protect him, especially his mother, but Richard's mother doesn't love him back. Oh, she that might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb. For Freud, when the love Richard gives away isn't returned, he shores up his sense of self-worth by repressing his instincts to love others. He saves all of his love for himself. Toward the end of his essay on narcissism, Freud explains that a healthy person's mind sets up an ideal in himself by which he measures his actual ego, what we call our conscience, as the required characteristics. Conscience comes from parents and culture. Since both have taught Richard to interpret his body figuratively, however, each is a source of agony. The rise of Richard's narcissism leads to the repression of his conscience. According to Freud, the final form of the work of repression in the obsessional neurosis is a sterile and never-ending struggle, which seems to be what's happening in Richard's final soliloquy. Soft I did but dream. Coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? Lights burn blue, it is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Then fly, what, from myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh no. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie, I am not. Fool, of thyself speak well. Fool, do not flatter. <laughs> My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. <sighs> all several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all guilty. Guilty. I shall despair. There is no creature loves me. And when I die, no soul shall pity me. Nay, wherefore should they, when I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Methought the souls of all that I had murdered come, came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. core of any modern interpretation with, of Richard III is, of any modern encounter with Richard III is interpretation. Not, not just in the context of other interpretations, but in the context of interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. So the emblem of this idea is Salvador Dali's 1955 portrait of Laurence Olivier in the role of Richard III, where the actor is awkwardly overlaying over the character. Olivier sitting for Dali is a photograph 
of a modern theatrical performance of an early modern work of literature based on medieval history, gesturing to the refractions of Richard over time, just as Olivier appears three times in the photograph, once in the chair, once in the mirror, and once in Dolly's canvas. As the viewer of this photograph, we consider one artist, Dolly, considering another artist, Olivier, considering another artist, Shakespeare, considering Richard III and his body. There are two ways to politicize Richard. The, the first emphasizes his impairment, drawing a parallel to the body of some political figure to degrade him, whether it's Robert Cecil in Shakespeare's day or the Nazi minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, who was born with a club foot. Such efforts are older, less prominent, and less interesting than the second model in which the central feature of Shakespeare's character, disability, is ignored to draw an analogy between Shakespeare's play and modern politics. So we see this in Richard Eyre's Nazi-themed production starring Ian McKellen, made into a, a film in 1995. After the Iraq War, Suleiman al-Bassam rewrote Richard III as an allegory for Saddam Hussein, excising and reimagining disability. But I, whose chest is weighed with a weatherproof heart, shorn of a mug to look, the lusty female eye, I, born to the mother with the narrow pelvis, spat into the world, so beaten, buckled, and battered, that even maids start at me, no lover I. House of Cards erased Richard's disability when turning him into a charmingly ambitious modern politician. Started in 2012, the gag Twitter account, at Richard III, which is filled with jokes about kingdoms for horses and happenings around Leicester and, and years-long rivalries with at King Henry VIII and at William Shakespeare. The account only mentions disability in four of its 9,617 tweets as of today. Stephen Greenblatt's 2016 op-ed for the New York Times, Shakespeare explains the 2016 election, <laughs> ignored disability to draw an analogy to Donald Trump. On the one hand, both are craven tyrants. On the other hand, Greenblatt shifts from character criticism to culture criticism, listing five ways in which Richard's England, like America, is a, quote, nation of enablers. Anton Juan and Ricardo Abed's play, Richard III, from 2018, erased Richard's disability to analogize him to then president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duarte. Trends in 20th and 21st century political, global, and digital Richards point to a key question. What are the implications of modern appropriations of Richard III that erase the motivating feature of Shakespeare's character, his disability? Years before playing Richard, Anthony Schur's Achilles tendon snapped during an accident on stage. He used arm crutches for six months, finding the experience frustrating. These emotions rushed back when he went looking for Richard. He used crutches for the performance, emphasizing Shakespeare's notion of a bottled spider. Distinguishing the deformity of Richard in Shakespeare's text from disability as a human experience, Schur concluded, quote, I had set out to look for a physical shape, but maybe what I found is something about being disabled. Scheer had experience with disability, but his casting still involved an able-bodied actor playing disabled. It took a second wave of disability activism marked in the United States by the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 and in the United Kingdoms by the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995 to inaugurate a new age in the casting of Richard III. The Czech star, Jan Popmischpiel, juxtaposed Richard's uh, medieval costumes and sets with his modern wheelchair, swapped at times for a palanquin throne or horse moved by an able-bodied actor under the saddle. In October 2001, a play called Dave Wants to Play Richard III ran in the basement of the St. Justine Children's Hospital in Montreal, Quebec. With the patients upstairs in mind, audiences saw Dave Ricker, an actor with cerebral palsy who uses a wheelchair, adapt Shakespeare's play into a reflection on the relationship between a disabled actor's body and the English language's most famous disabled character. In one account, the focus of the spectator is not so much what the lines are saying, but how they are made to read on Dave's body. With Catherine Hunter at the Globe in 2003, the intersection of disability-based and gender-based stigma was in play. In Peter Dinklage's 2004 performance at the Public Theater in New York, society's impulse not to stare at people with disabilities allowed Richard III to get away with things when people aren't looking. <laughs> Henry Holden's 2005 Richard III in New York gave us an exhausted employee in the workplace, <clears throat> one who grows increasingly frustrated with day-to-day -day discrimination. Rene Moreno, only, his only requirement was that the set be ADA compliant, except for a small staircase that he couldn't climb, indic indicating Richard's exclusion. Mm 
Moreno's performance was informed by his experience working in an industry often unwelcoming to people with disabilities. Stephen Madigan performed Richard III also in a wheelchair in an amateur 2015 pr production. Uh, Madigan wanted to inspire people with disabilities to achieve success. Maybe it was an earth-shattering theater, but it was life-affirming for him and for many in his audience. The tone was indignant in 2016 in Winnipeg starring Debbie Patterson advertised as a disability revenge play. <laughs> Michael Patrick Thornton pinned his enemies in his walker showing Richard's willingness to use disability to gain leverage over others. In the scene of his coronation, Thornton's Richard used a robotic exoskeleton that allowed him to stand and walk, physical ability representing Richard coming into power. Quote, I saw his skeleton on TV and it was like looking at an x-ray of my own spine, end quote, said Australian actor Kate Mulaney Mulvaney, uh, alluding to cancer treatment she underwent in childhood. Quote, I have the same condition as Richard's severe scoliosis. I know exactly the kind of pain he suffered. Matt Fraser saw himself as an ambassador for disabled actors and press coverage simmered with his calculated anger. Every single theater in Britain, he said, should be able to answer yes to the question, have you employed one disabled actor in the last year? If the answer to that question is no, then the theater should hang its head in shame and know that it is a relic of the past. When Arthur Hughes took the role in 2022, the headline was, there's a truth to it. RSC cast disabled actor as Richard III. The motive behind the cripping of Richard III, casting disabled actors to play a disabled character, isn't simply that a disabled actor can connect with and portray Shakespeare's disabled king better than an able-bodied actor. If we see this attitude as the aesthetic motivation behind the crip of Richard, the political motivation has exerted more force. A disabled actor playing Richard III exemplifies the recent push for greater inclusion in theatrical casting. The political motives behind the cripping of Richard III are most fully present not in performances of Shakespeare's play, but in adaptations, which then activate the aesthetic motives of cripping Richard by infusing a, uh, the disability movement's kind of key uh, sens uh, sensibility, nothing about us without us. In 2012, Greg Mosgala, who's the founder and artistic director of the Apothetai, a New York theater company exploring the disability experience, Uh, Mizgala commissioned Mike Liu to write an adaptation of Richard III set in American high school. A proponent of Asian American theater, the able-bodied Liu saw parallels between barriers to disability in the theater industry and racist exclusions he had experienced himself. At the start of their play with its ungoogleable title, Teenage Dick, <laughs> they don't mince words. Quote, cast disabled actors for Richard and Buck. They exist and they are out there. Also cast diverse actors. Similarly, Richard III Redux, written by Katie O'Reilly and Philip Zarilli, and first performed by Sarah Beers in 2018, is, quote, a one-woman show about Richard III from a disability perspective, performed by someone with the same physicality as the historical Richard, end quote. O'Reilly's political motives are strategic, precise, and explicit. Quote, as a counter to the, to the tradition of cripping up in Shakespeare's Richard III, we offer the rights to this text solely to the atypical performer, those who identify as disabled, end quote. Ultimately, Richard III Redux shows the inseparability of the political and the aesthetic motives for cripping Richard, and the priority of the political. Casting people with disabilities is necessary for an accurate artistic representation of the disabled experience. <coughs> Summer 2022 was really Richard's glorious summer, with four major productions appearing all at once. The Lost King, a feature film starring Sally Hawkins, commemorated the 10th anniversary of the, the discovery of Richard's skeleton on August 24, 2012. But it also stirred controversy about the representation of academic work in mainstream media. Denai Guerrero was the first black woman to play Richard III on a major stage. That casting has been celebrated for opening up ideas about theatrical intersectionality how does a disabled character's body read when seen by a black actress's body? The production has also been questioned for having an able-bodied actor crip up to play disabled, especially in light of the Royal Shakespeare Company's concurrent production featuring Arthur Hughes, a disabled actor playing Shakespeare's disabled character. The public instead featured disabled actors throughout its ensemble. Ali Stroker as Lady Anne, Monique Holt as the Duchess of York, and Greg Mosgala as Henry Tudor, among others. <coughs> 
among other things, what I've discovered since our reading group 18 years ago <laughs> is a role for Shakespeare in disability history. Deeply embedded in an early modern age that saw the rebirth of ancient European culture, yet alive today all around us in performance and adaptation, Shakespeare invites expansive disability histories that span centuries and continents. Richard III may be the main site of this methodology, but it could extend to Falstaff, Ophelia, Hamlet, Lear, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, Othello, Caliban, and many others. An interpretation of Richard's body is never just an interpretation of Richard's body. When we interpret Richard's disability, it interprets us in return. Shakespeare's plays, their sources, and receptions are an opportunity to see disability through time. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the sun of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now instead of mounting barbed steeds to threat the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and yet so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I Halt by them. Why, I in this weak and piping time of peace have no delight to pass away the time unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Wonderful. Um, we learned so much. We're moved. We're educated. Um, it was great. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, for people on Zoom, uh, you may not hear the questions from the floor, so we might want to repeat sure. them back. Sure. Um, but we would love to hear from folks. So, um, questions for either our actor or our scholar. Let's jump here. Uh, have you been in a production of your show this year? I'm not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't have more for that. <laughs> yes, yes, you can go. Um, so, um, I was drawn to where you were talking about Trevor Baldi and like perspective and like seeing that photography and you talked about the different perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question was uh, about the Dolly photograph um, and the perspective of the photographer, who is definitely making artistic decisions about how to frame that that shot. And and we are our possible interpretations are are you know limited by uh, the the choices that, that the artists have made. Um, but that really just kind of happens all the way down with with Richard. You know that that every single articulation, every single interpretation, every single manifestation um, it seems like we we put a little bit of a, a you know, ourselves into it, and, and I suppose, uh, you know, that, that I guess we, we called the talk, you know, looking for Richard, but kind of when we go looking for Richard, sometimes we're speaking for Richard, and, and sometimes we're looking away from Richard, sometimes we're looking at ourselves, so it, I think the priority of the visual, um, that, that, that photograph is my favorite for exactly that reason. Thanks. 
right. <laughs> right, absolutely. I mean, um, so the Wars of the Roses weren't called the Wars of the Roses until the 19th century, when Shakespeare, who made a whole lot of the symbolism of the roses, had skyrocketed to stardom. And, and so Shakespeare, you know, whether we like it or not now, is going to be one kind of central way into this history. You can't really get around it. Um, the, the way that I see it is, is that interpreting, interpreting disability in life is a lot like interpreting disability in Shakespeare's plays, not because um, the plays are an exact copy of nature because they're far, far from it, but there's just so many interpretations and, and you know, between us and, and the thing that we would want to interpret, and we have to kind of weed through all of those, that, that it's hard to kind of find any, any stable ground there. So with respect to, to the historical Richard III, you know, um, efforts have been made to, to uh, get beyond Shakespeare to the history. Efforts have, have been made to try to um, tell the, the, the real history that, that Shakespeare got wrong. Um, but for me, what's, what's most fascinating is not sort of who gets Richard right or wrong, but why do all of these people have so many different uh, opinions about Richard? And, and this is a question I would also equally kind of have <laughs> for everyone here. What, why Richard III? Like, what, what is it about this guy that is just so captivating that, you know, 500 years of, of history just can't give up on Richard III? I don't know, that didn't answer your question very well. <laughs> you also uh, interpreted the Wars of the Roses in Game of Thrones. What about disability in Game of Thrones? Yeah. So, so disability is everywhere all over Game of Thrones. Um, Shakespeare, I think it's probably not an exaggeration to say that, that Shakespeare's Richard III invented the stigmatized protagonist, the person who has um, been dealt an unfair disadvantage in life and then has to overcome um, all odds and, and you know, exercise a heroic uh, willpower in order to uh, achieve great things. You see that with you know, Daenerys Targaryen, who is stigmatized because she's a woman. You see that with Tyrion Lannister, who's stigmatized because of his disability. You see that with Jon Snow, who's stigmatized because he's a bastard. So, so I think in Game of Thrones, a lot of uh, what happens is Richard III kind of gets diffused throughout that narrative and, and pops up in a whole bunch of different places. disabled actor, uh, how you feel playing character. a disabled character, which might also in some ways respond to Jesus's question as well about performing this role. Yeah. And then I have a follow-up question for Jeff. Yeah, I mean, obviously, kind of throughout the content of this lecture, um, it's, there are a lot of pieces of the, of the puzzle to, to talk about. I think from my perspective as an actor who is, you're not necessarily saying, I'm going to play this role and now I will play it. You're, you're auditioning for a role or you're cast in a role or you're given an opportunity to perform um, a role. And I think at, at all times, but especially in a case like this where you are dealing with these sensitive issues of, of disability, um, for me it's about, uh, I made a choice with today not to try to perform that, to try to bring that to this presentation because that wasn't something that I felt like I wanted to um, present with be not being or being an able-bodied person um, and uh, if that was something that a production was going to handle that would be something that would be worked out over a long produ or production rehearsal process and um, be a subject of a lot of discussion I think in the case of today the opportunity that I had to pr present the language um, I wanted to focus much more on um, where I could relate to the speeches that I was presenting um, you know, so, so finding my way into it, which is much more about dealing with the feelings that might be more universal, less applicable to the specifics of, of his stigmatization, but about feeling um, judgments that, that you feel are put upon you. And uh, in most of these speeches, him kind of finding a way to identify with them or kind of use the, the negativity that's, pr that's pushed towards him to kind of use them as a, as a weapon back. Um, so that's sort of the way that I found my way into it. Um, 
and kind of some of the things I was thinking about with, with this role. And I, I think it's a great uh, move with, with productions of Shakespeare to all of the stuff that you covered in your, in your lecture, seeing more people to, uh, who are able to bring out those, um, you know, those things that I cannot uh, bring to the character and understand about the character's psychology. Beautiful, thank you. I'm standing over here because I'm trying to get <laughs> the microphone. So the other <laughs> Not weird at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other question, I'm hoping I'm remembering this correctly because from the back of the room on the Zoom computer, but has to do with um, a very thoughtful question about it's great to have the casting of disabled actors playing a disabled character but does that run the risk of reducing that actor to their disability? Yeah. Could you address that issue? I hope I got that right. Yeah, um, absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, just re real quickly, a, a word about when we started kind of talking about, you know, oh, what performance choices will you make? I, I think the thing that Thomas said that kind of stuck with me was this point about, I, I want it to be a linguistic performance. And then kind of one of the things that I mentioned to Thomas and Julia was, is, you know, the, the only thing that, we absolutely have to do is to be mindful about how we perform disability. And, and I think we had some really good conversations where, where we, we thought about this and we thought about um, not being a professional production company with a large infrastructure to, uh, you know, kind of fully work out these, these things and this being an academic setting. That, that, that th this really sort of emphasis on the linguistic, that, that made a lot of sense to me. So thank you for that, Thomas. Um, Yes, uh, casting an actor, a disabled actor as Richard III purely because of disability uh, does run the risk of uh, reducing that actor to disability. Um, I see that largely overweighed by the positive benefits of that practice. Um, and, and really it's, it's not, the argument is not for disabled characters you need to have a disabled actor. The argument is we just need to have more realistic representation on the theatrical stage of all the disability we see all around us in life. And so uh, I, I think, you know, if you're a disabled actor, I think you want to get cast as a banker or a jilted lover, not as a disabled banker or a disabled jilted lover necessarily. So Richard III being sort of the central site of disability in English theater um, has, has become this platform for working out this, this tension where First comes the, uh, the, the the idea of the disabled character should be played by a disabled actor, and later I think uh, the hope is comes along um, disabled actors get cast for as many roles as there are out there. Um, sometimes those roles will have disability as a feature of the character's story, but a lot of times they won't. A lot of the times it'll just be someone who's having a, a tragic story or a comic story who happens to be disabled and doesn't need to be a centerpiece of the story told or their identity. That's great. And I've, I've seen a bunch of productions, well, before 2020, when I was seeing a lot of productions <laughs> in England, uh, I was seeing a lot of deaf actors incorporated into Shakespeare with sign and also with different kinds of vocalizations on stage. And just as part of the cast, like kind of unmarked and yet present and yeah. contributing, and I thought that was very powerful. Um, I think we have time for, yes, Elizabeth Allen, our chair. You started with music. I remember that. <laughs> this is kind of a double dog tail question about music. Um, and it has to do with this question of community representation on stage. And that is, if you know, if, if you're okay, you gave us this this nice, uh, very useful, very clarifying distinction between disability as the sign of Richard's evil and disability as the cause of his evil. And in some ways, when you get to when you get that latter explanation, you you have erased the, the problem of equating disability and the 
You, you have, though, right? In a way, you have said it's understandable. There's a there's a there's a narrative here, but you've erased something that's really uncomfortable about Richard, and that is his the way in which his physical attributes sort of allegorize his evil, potentially. See what I'm asking? Well, um, so if, if that, okay, maybe that's not the case, but my question is, is kind of the broader question of the ethics of um, associating disability with this particular character, um, you know, situationally, that's what's happening. Um, and how much does that contribute then to this kind of um, rendering of disability as associated with evil? Yeah. Again, um, it's a devil's advocate question, but I'd like to hear you grapple. With no, it. I, I mean, having sat through Elizabeth's medieval drama class and Chaucer class, I, I knew she was going <laughs> to bring some, some precision and rigor here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> one, one, one thing that happened that may touch upon this a little bit is that um, 1612 Francis Bacon writes his essay of deformity which basically kind of gives a philosophical explanation of what Shakespeare was suggesting that, that disability is not the sign but is the, the cause of, uh, of villainy or evil. Um, to me, that is a modern, more sort of horizontal, less spiritual interpretation of what's going on there, but it's still a little bit magical because it suggests a necessary connection between one thing, disability, is necessarily going to lead to evil, which, I mean, look around, that's just like objectively not true, right? Um, so, so what happened in the middle of the 18th century was a, a little bit of nuance was brought to that by a fellow named William Hay, who, who um, presented Bacon's thesis that disability leads to villainy as a possible thing that we have seen happen, but not a necessary you know, psychological transaction that is going to happen. So that, that's one area where that, um, that psychological model or the, the causal reading of, of disability, I, I, I still, I don't think that kind of gets, I, I don't find that a, a satisfying interpretation. Is, is one way to, to think about it. Um, I, I think, well, I, I don't know. I, I guess for me, the um, Shakespearean perspective goes beyond the, so, the spiritual model, goes beyond the psychological model, and lands on something that we could probably call like a sociological model, where, where for Shakespeare, for 20th century sociologists like Irving Goffman, um, for, for myself, you know, there, there's not kind of a specific meaning of disability other than here's what all of these other people have done with it. And we can give a little bit of a narrative to that history. And that to me feels like the most ethical response, but I'm not quite sure how to locate evil in all of that. in the Middle Ages a little bit, thinking about like morality plays, but also medieval like medicine and the way in which they perceived their environment as directly affecting their bodies and their bodies as directly affecting their environment. Um, so that might, because you're kind of doing this reach back, um, I mean, ideas of, from medieval medicine kind of go very much past when we know, like, you know, we know that that's not how the body works. Um, so I was wondering if that might add something to this idea of evil because the, the ways in which the body can be affected by the environment and vice versa. Yeah. Okay, so it's fine you add your question to that. Yeah. And we'll talk uh, to that. Derek, from a, I'm trying to think of it from like a director's point of view, like how would we solve that paradox of mm -hmm. here you have a main character who is evil, who, who is related to disability. How do we make it so that the audience doesn't you know, younger kids come in here and they think, oh, disabled means evil. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I try to think about Shakespeare a lot on the class levels that each character plays. And it would be really interesting to have maybe other disabled actors 
playing characters within this, within a Richard III uh, production that are also disabled, but maybe are not tempted by power, or don't have the access at, of well, on everything that Richard III has, or like the temptation, because he has accessibility towards being able to be king eventually. So it'd be really interesting to see from a directorial point of view, not only having Richard III as this person who has access to all the resources, but also someone else as part of that same production, portraying and performing as a disabled, physically disabled individual as a parallel to someone like Richard III who is dual. It would be interesting. So Jeff Thomas, clo closing comments. I mean, that, that's a fascinating note. Um, I, I suppose one of the questions about ethics that, that comes up is what do you do when someone who has suffered a grave injustice is also a bad person? And, and, and that's, you know, a, a that, that, that's why we need drama, right? Is, is because I, I think we can kind of with stories, we can ask that question, but it's always gonna have to be answered kind of in the particular situation that you're in. Like it's hard for me to even imagine what a principle would be for, for responding to that in the abstract. You sort of deal with it on a case by case basis. And with every Richard III, we're gonna get a little bit nu nuanced in, in different ways and, and you're, you're gonna be able to respond to that production, but maybe not to the, the story or the character in the abstract. Great, Thomas? Yeah. Um, I think uh, just kind of as a closing thought in relation to this this topic of, of the evil and and, and and the evil and as related or separate from the what what is put upon Richard by disability or by others in regard to his disability. I feel like the, the other big perspective difference is that from the actor, where it's not my job as the actor to interpret this character as evil. In fact, it's the absolute opposite. The, the more reprehensible of a character that I'm given to play or, or interpret or understand, the more I have to work to try and think from that perspective and, un, and understand a way in which I can feel like what I am doing and saying is right. Um, and I think that in conjunct that, that, that's part of the, the, the job that I have to do, but I think that also works in ways of helping answer that question in a particular way that the production or the directorial point of view wants to handle the question. Um, because if we are trying to find out that, that question of what happens when this character is, has certain things that we would view as morally reprehensible and also is being treated in a similar way, um, you know, I think that ha that's part of that discussion is always thinking from an actor's point of view, th this character doesn't think he's evil. He talks about playing evil. But I think what was very interesting in these speeches that we talked, to, talked about today or presented today is that at the beginning, fine, I'll be evil. I'll play evil. <laughs> You keep telling me this, I'll do it. But then by the end, his actual reconciliation with this idea of I am a villain is sort of his beginning of his recognition of I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was reflecting what was being projected towards me. And I don't know that I am doing the right thing anymore. Um, so finding that, uh, finding that perspective, I think, might contribute to this, this complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank our wonderful tech. I want to thank the Jews and our audience here today coming out in the rain. And of course, I really want to thank Jeffrey and Thomas. They'll hang out for a few minutes to do a few copies of Jeff's book. I know that he's got former teachers here and fellow students and <laughs> others who want to say hi to him. So um, I think there might be a little bit of coffee left. A few cookies. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you so much.